Hey guys, it's Micah, the host of another Philosophical Tuesday. Thank you for joining us as we try to have our cake and eat it too. In today's podcast, we begin with a discussion contrasting the dangers of living impulsively versus incalculated fear. Specifically, we explore the pros and cons of planning too little or too much. We ask how to decide whether a risk is reasonable or not, and we probe the intricacies and moral dimensions of social manipulation. Thanks for listening. We hope you enjoy this episode. Okay, guys, so welcome to another episode. It's another Philosophical Tuesday here. Uh, Josh Charlton isn't with us today, so it's just me and Josh Smith, and we're just going to talk and see what happens. We're going to take a little break from uh, from the conversation we've been having and just uh, talk about whatever tonight. So, Well, Micah, you, over the past week, went hunting, and you, okay, you sent me a picture of you sitting in a tree smoking a cigar with a gun. What that is true. what's what's the backstory? Okay, so I was hunting and I wanted to smoke a cigar and so I did that. No, um more Come specifically, <laughs> I was more specifically I was um I was no, I was telling I was telling some some of my cigar smoking buddies that I was going hunting and they they suggested that you know, it's it's always good to bring a cigar when you go hunting. And so I said, you know, that's a good idea. I'll, I think I'll do that. So, you know, it was, you know, it was about, I was sitting in the tree stand all day. So, you know, from about probably about 530 in the morning and I had brought a stick with me and I wasn't sure if I was going to smoke it. But around, around the part of the middle part of the day, um, if you ever go hunting, deer hunting, it, the, the middle part of the day from about noon to two o'clock, there's almost almost nothing ever happens. You almost never see any deer because it's just warm um, and the sun's out. So during that, that nice little middle part of the day, I, I got, I broke out my, uh, broke out my cigar and had a smoke. So that was nice. So you said you create some sort of nook in the tree to sit. While no, it's you a, wait it's for a, the deer. It's, it's, it's a tree stand. So it's a, what it is, is it's a, there's a, there's different kinds of tree stands. So when you, when you, when you deer hunt, you, it's off, you often sit in a tree because that way the deer can't see you. And also, um, you can see a lot more from the top of a tree. But um, what you actually do is you put basically a metal chair up in the tree. Um, sometimes it's like supported from the ground with like a ladder that leans up against the tree. Sometimes it's just like tied to the tree and kind of like nailed in. Um, and then you climb up a ladder up to the tree, up to the, up to the seat and you sit up there and you, you wait for the deer. So that's, that's what a tree stand is. And you smoked a cigar up there. I did. I did. Nice. Smoke a, I smoked a cigar up in a tree. So that was fun. That's but actually awesome. that was, yeah, yeah. That was kind of like one of the things I wanted to like sort of poke at here is this question of, um, so I, I smoke cigars. Um, now that's a, that's something I like to do because I enjoy smoking a cigar. I especially enjoy smoking a cigar whenever I'm, I'm able to have a conversation with friends while I'm doing it. Um, however, um, smoking a cigar is, uh, in one way or another, something that is a health risk. Yeah. It's a health risk I'm willing to take. So I thought maybe we could explore the idea of like why we choose to do certain things, even though they're risky you know, what's the cost versus benefit over those sorts of things. Did you have any thoughts on that? I think a lot of enjoyable things in life come with significant risk. I've heard some of them, of course, are risks I'm willing to take as well. I also smoke cigars and I mean, I drink coffee. That's a health risk. <laughs> Even if there are some <laughs> health benefits of eating dark chocolate, it's good for your heart and coffee uh, I've heard coffee's good for your heart. I'm sure it's good for some other stuff as well, but caffeine can create dependency and also be bad for your your kidneys or liver, um, especially if you're taking like drugs like ibuprofen and stuff like that. Um, yeah. And yet, you drink alcohol and then you you toss a few ibuprofen to wake up the next morning, which really is not good for your for your liver. So, <laughs> um. 
but there are some other health risks. Well, not necessarily health risks, but risks such as skydiving that I'm not willing to take because it's scary. I'm sure I'd do it, but it's really scary. <laughs> I could see you skydiving, but I could also see you chickening out of skydiving. I mean, I <laughs> yes, I would be I, the uh, one to fly up in the sky and then just say nope. <laughs> I would not fly up in the sky. I would, uh, I would be the one to fly up in the sky to watch somebody else do it, and then they would try and convince me while it was up there. And you would definitely not do it. I would. I would. I don't think I could do it. No. I. I. Mm -mm, nope. I. Jumping out of a out of a plane, if if I had absolute certainty that the parachute would open, no problems, no problems at all. But that 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 five percent chance that I don't like it, I don't like it. But yeah, but no, I mean you're you're right. I mean there are. It's 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 impossible. I mean it's impossible to do anything at, at, in life without assuming some risk. It's it's impossible to be alive without assuming the risk that you might not be alive. Um, but which is interesting because, you know, th that in and of itself, I mean, fundamentally, there is risk to living by being, by being alive, you risk not being alive. And the, the things you do can increase the, the degree to which you feel like you're alive, increase the degree to which you're enjoying your life while at the same time, increasing the risk that you would no longer be alive. And I think the key is often to finding what is worth what is worth living for you know what is worth doing um it, or what we might even say what is worth taking the risk for you know right and there are two extremes that one might gravitate towards one would be the extreme of absolute certainty in which you robotically calculate all the possibilities and achieve a mastery of of the type of skill needed to algorithmically understand the universe. And there's the other extreme in which you aren't a robot and you actually enjoy life because you have emotion, but you just kind of mindlessly wander, enjoying physical gratification at every given moment. And never stop to think, should I possibly save this money for next week when I might need it? And then basically having no direction in life. Right, right. I mean, it's... It's it's, it's quite it's sad extreme. because right. the, the, ro the, um, the mindless wanderer will never get anywhere in life, and yet he might enjoy it. But the robotic... The robotic uh, like, let's say the, the AI, the sentient robotic man might get whatever he wants, but never be able to enjoy it. Well, I mean, you have people who are overly, overly uh, pragmatic, overly conscientious, you know, people who are so determined to avoid risk. And th th there's some people who are this, who are, who are so, de it's, it's never healthy, actually, to be incredibly determined to avoid risk, because you can't actually do anything if you're you know, utterly determined to avoid risk. Um, well, you know, and actually, some people have OCD. You know, that's that's one of the big problems that a lot of people with OCD have. Is they're so afraid to act because they don't know what might happen. Right. And one giant downside of that is that risk can be navigated if you prepare yourself for it, and if you mm. build up an endurance. You know the the scene from the the princess bride where the guy like drinks the poison and 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 well they both drink the poison spoiler alert and the one guy dies and the other guy doesn't and it's because he built up a an immunity to the poison and that's what you need to do with difficult challenges in life you need to increase your stamina you need to work out at the gym if you want to be able to lift that heavy heavy weight that you aren't able to lift right it's it's it would be a risk for me to go in in the gym and try to lift like one of those 150 pound bars because I'm not physically prepared for that. So should I just say I'm going to avoid the risk altogether and not step inside the gym? No, my my correct response would be to 
start with the 50 pounders, work my way up every single day, do one or two more reps, work my way up weight wise until I finally get to the 150 pounder. And so you can, you can learn how to, to build up endurance without putting yourself in unnecessary risk. But then there's then there's situations where building up endurance is impossible, you know, where it's sort of a net, sort of a net, uh, a net negative, if you will. I mean, theoretically, eating a bowl of ice cream is a net negative. I mean, what benefit are you getting from eating a bowl of ice cream? You're getting it, it in in a. It depends on your perspective, right? If you're looking at it from a perspective of physical health and fitness, it's you know, a bowl of ice cream is a net negative. If you're looking at it from a perspective of that is unless you're starving, in which case it's a definitely not positive. But if you're looking at it, you know, if you're an average American and you're looking at it from the perspective of you had a long, hard day and you want something nice, then it's it's a net positive. You know, it's it's how do you weigh the instantaneous want and the instantaneous benefit with a long term benefit? You know, one of the things I, I like about smoking cigars is that I feel like when I'm doing it with other people there's actually a, a more of a long-term benefit than there is an instantaneous benefit. I get the, both the benefit of pleasure and fellowship as well as, you know, building myself up through conversation. Right. And, um, and it, it creates memories. The memories you will have will not be of smoking the cigar unless it was like a fantastic cigar, which is probably not likely. Right. I'm gonna <laughs> I, I've never it. smoked I'm a cigar that remember. is so memorable right. that I remember that specific cigar. But what I do remember is the company I was in when I when I smoked the cigar or or the perhaps stupid crap that we talked about, whatever it was. It, right, it, right. It, the cigar was kind of the it helped it helped create the bond in a sense because it was something we were all doing together. But it was not something that in and of itself held so much value that I would smoke five cigars a day by myself. Right, right. Well, and and it kind of so there's an episode of Rick and Morty. I believe it's season four, episode one, in which Morty discovers this this um, it's a it's a device that allows him to see all the ways he's gonna die. So every time he commits an mm, action, mm-hmm. he sees he's going to die doing this thing or that thing. So he finds the one, the one storyline in which he does not die and gets to be with Jessica the girl he has a crush on and he follows down that that storyline and basically at the end of the episode it it comes out that the reason he got to be with Jessica is because he was dying in an old folks home and she was his caretaker so it wasn't exactly the love story he had imagined um but i think at the end of the episode Rick said We've learned a huge lesson here, folks. You need to live in the present, but also be thinking about the future. And it's like, really, that is that is your huge life lesson. Um, <laughs> but it, but it's true though. Like you need to be balancing, constantly balancing mm-hmm. the actions you take in the present, because well, the actions you take in the present with the the building up of a a a foundation for yourself in the future. It's important to enjoy the present to an extent, otherwise you'll get depressed, you'll get bored, you'll really well, just not have a reason for for going into the future whatsoever. But if well, you're never I mean, thinking Go ahead. Well I was just gonna say I mean it's like if if all you if you spend your entire life preparing for the future, you're never going to you know, you're always going to be preparing for the next thing. And you're never go- once you're gonna end up old and not being having a future to prepare for anymore. And you're just going to, you're just going to, I mean, I think this is what happens to a lot of people who just retire and don't do anything. They've been always, they've been preparing and pushing for retirement their entire life. And then they get there and they don't have anything to prepare for and push to anymore. And they don't know what to do because they've never stopped to enjoy life. They've just gone. They've just been go, go, go the whole time, you know? Right. And Um, it's also like, what is your what is your vision for when you retire? And they're like, okay, I'm maybe going down to the beach, maybe drinking some margaritas, um, going to travel around the world. And it's like those things are fun, and maybe you could travel to a few places, go to a few beaches. But after a while, that gets boring. The same as your nine to five job got boring. And so, 
I think well, like are you just living to retire at that point though? Like yeah, are you living to not, retire? <laughs> like why why are you looking at retirement and being like once I get there that's when I'll have made it. It's like no, you've made it right now. You're an adult. I mean, let's be honest. It's it's a rough time becoming an adult, but once you get to be an adult, you, you you're an adult for a long time and it's about time to sit down and stop constantly looking at the future and saying, "No, I'm here. This is my life." I'm going to enjoy it. I'm going to prepare for the future so I can continue to enjoy it. But I'm going to enjoy it, and I'm going to live my life. Yeah. And if you retire, having that mentality still, the the one in which you retire and live that amazing life, then you're going to be living for death, basically. Just the same way as you were living for retirement before Mm, mm -hmm. you retired. Yeah, because that's the next next logical thing. Yeah. Yeah, and it's well, either you're living moment to moment with no long term plan, in which your your big next step is the next margarita you're gonna drink or the next city you'll set foot in, or if you have the long term plan, it's gonna be death unless you've decided you're going to, in your retirement, in your old age, decide to create this. This machine that is able to keep you alive. Hmm. Maybe pull one of those uh those carbonite stunts or or like the whole Walt <laughs> Disney like you freeze uh, yourself. Freeze yeah. yourself. <laughs> oh man. Yeah, it's It's like what are you living for? Yeah. So smoke a cigar or do something. Do something you, know, you enjoy. It might not be the most healthy thing in the world, and that's okay as long as it's a calculated risk and you know why you're doing it. But yeah. don't don't start smoking a pack a pack of cigarettes every day. You know. Well, and here's the distinction I would make: build up good habits. If you consistently notice yourself doing something that that brings you a lot of happiness in the moment, then you should be extremely critical of it. Hmm. The the more like thrill and pleasure and happiness that something gives you the more you should be questioning why you are doing this thing and the best strategy is to is to live your life building up good habits that lead to good long-term outcomes and once you are solidified in those habits you need to learn how to chill a little bit and enjoy a cigar every once in a while enjoy an extra piece of pie after dinner or whatever um, right. enjoy maybe a pizza before you go to the gym or whatever. I mean, not before you go to the gym, probably. <laughs> that, that wouldn't be... <laughs> yeah, the that's a bad idea. I speak from experience there. Yeah. Yeah. But it's it's important that you don't overindulge. Right. Right. No, I mean, if you're indulging before your responsibilities are in order, you're going to continue to indulge because it feels like a way to avoid your responsibilities. I mean, this is... This is it something we've all dealt with growing up i think it certainly certainly is my my natural point of operation you know i want to just do the things that i feel like i want to do you know but um it's much more satisfying to do those things when i feel like i'm letting myself have have something nice rather than having something nice because i feel like i'm i'm owed it you know yeah it becomes it becomes old becomes mm-hmm. kind of dreary if you do it all the time and it's something that's nice the word nice kind of loses its meaning you know i mean the, the word pleasurable the word the word satisfactory the you know restful yeah you know i'm just crashing you know we, we go from relaxing to crashing you know we go from um you know it's uh we go from wow that was you know I, I, having thanksgiving dinner the other day it was like you know, having a, a fully home cooked meal for the first time in a long time, and just you know all of those familiar Thanksgiving dishes. It was uh, there was something about it that was just so satisfying because I hadn't eaten that much or that delicious of food in a long time, and it was it just stuck out to me. You know, I always every time I would have Thanksgiving in the past, it would be like, okay, that was really good. I got to eat a lot of food, but this this time it was like, no, I got to eat good food, and it was enjoyable, yeah. and that was something I had been lacking. You know. Yeah, it's probably because you moved out of your parents, and now you don't get to right. enjoy their good cooking. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, that's the that's the main thing. Yep. Um, 
Yeah, definitely. I was going to say something. I forget what. <laughs> well, um, I oh, I, I remember what it was. So, in college, I tended to have a very disorganized schedule. I would, like, be in the middle of doing my school, and then I would get bored, so I would, I would turn on Netflix and start binging a show, binging The Office, binging something that I didn't have to think too much about that would just kind of pass the time. And after a while, I'd uh-huh. be like, all right, I, fin- I need to finish writing this paper, and so I would write a little bit more, and then I'd get bored. I'd do a little bit of my, my homework for a different class because I was bored. It was just a an unceasing unceasing um timeline of boredom and i kind of tried to pass the time by indulging in whatever was less bad than the the thing i was doing in the present mm-hmm. but it was just so disorganized i i i needed to learn which i eventually did to finish my work in a in a good amount of time so that I can enjoy the things I enjoy doing afterwards ah, so much more so much more fulfilling once you learn how to put in the hours and work hard and then be able to enjoy maybe watching a few episodes of something or eating a nice dinner or something like that at the end of the day mhm you feel like there's some finality to it you know you're not just and and you know it's it's you're not even you're not even just do it. You're not doing it to avoid something. You're doing it because, because it is what you can do. You know, um, yeah. Because nice. I want to do it, right. not because I'm trying to avoid something else. Yeah, and I feel like I earned it as well. I feel mm-hmm. like the the good feeling that I get from having submitted a paper and gotten a grade on it is worthwhile, rather than just. Oh, the effort I put into this paper was just mindless boredom. Right. Right. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's, that's I think, one of the reasons why I like pool so much as a sport. Oh, yeah? I'm, I just really enjoy it because what you kind of want to do is get up there and just shoot at the balls because otherwise you get bored. Just, yeah, that's what like, I end up Shoot doing. at the ball, shoot at the next ball, shoot at the next ball, like... You probably aren't lined up very well for your next shot, but what what you notice if you watch some of the like really professionals play, like Shane Van mm-hmm. Boning or or Efren Reyes, someone like that, and they have like the entire table all planned out, and they know exactly where the cue ball is going to go after they take their shot. They know they they take their time when necessary to make a shot. Rather than going for a subpar shot that might make the ball in, but not line you up for the next one, and that's some, that's a sport I really want to get good at because it helps build your endurance or maybe your patience at least. <laughs> well, it's interesting because they're I mean it, it, they are building patience. They're denying their senses um, so that they can engage their mind. Um, and then have the satisfaction of of the win and the victory, you know. There, rather than going in and just shooting the ball, you know, like I said, like I like to do, you know, they're they're taking their time to stop and think about it. Uh, yeah, and it's it's actually kind of the same thing with chess, because there mm-hmm. are two extremes with chess. There's the one person who you're playing against, and they're just sitting there looking at the board, and you're just waiting for them to take their turn, and it takes forever, and they somehow play this perfect like move. You're in checkmate, whatever, whatever. Like, that game wasn't fun because the other person just sat there like a stone wall. Then there are the people who just, like, just move the pieces and, like, don't know what they're doing and they're just having fun. <laughs> and so it's like, you got to find some middle ground where you actually try to get good at the game, but at the same time, don't calculate every single possibility. Well, I'm not even trying to say you shouldn't calculate every single possibility. I think. Once you start to develop systems and patterns for for being good at the game, then you shouldn't have to think so hard about it because you know right. you're able to look at the big picture. You're able to see the direction that the game is going in and what move you should make based on that. Huh. 
I like chess, but I'm not that great at it. Well, you're better than me. You always beat me when I play, but for that exact reason you just described, you know. I well, try and think about it, but at some point I get lazy and I just want to make a move, so I make a move. Yeah, but you I know, also like, kind of just have fun and move the pieces without thinking too much about it. <laughs> you also have more of that felt knowledge of uh, of a strategy, you know, from, from having played more and, and knowing a little bit of behind uh, how to play the game, you know. You've got... You've built up some of that felt knowledge that you don't have to necessarily think about it as much. You know, whereas I'm sitting yeah. there trying to analyze every outcome of every move, which isn't necessarily the best way to to play the game. Yeah, there's there's different playing styles, and I'm definitely more on the side of just move the pieces around and don't think too much about it. Yeah. So kind of relating to the whole past-present thing, looking sure. ahead so i when i am in a social gathering what i tend to do is often act very i act, as most people say i act like a crackhead and the reason for that is because i i actually am quite the people pleaser which is not something that most people would peg me as but mm. i i i think i do it, it's kind of funny I think what happens is I put too much stock in what other people think about me. But then there's this other part of me that wants to kind of stifle that and wants to say, no, other people shouldn't think highly of you. And in response to that, I I act like a goofball and tell lots of jokes and try to become the – I kind of try to become the joke of the social mm. situation. Almost as if there just needs to be some sort of chaos or, or, or humor you're, added you're not... into the into the um, atmosphere. I don't know why I do it exactly, but it's like I feel like I have two modes. One mode is I just act like a crackhead because mm -hmm. I'm trying to stifle some part of myself that's a people pleaser, and the other side of me just wants to sit back and observe, just wants to understand everything that is going on in the in the situation understand everyone's intentions everyone's motivations what people are thinking when they're saying something and i can do that if i try hard enough but to me that's just too robotic too uncaring and the other side is caring but just weird <laughs> i mean it's interesting because neither of those are responses that are attempting to just enjoy the enjoy the experience I just kind of live in the moment, you know. It's they're, they're both responses that are attempting to do something with it. Yeah, you're right. I and mean, I, 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 think I kind of go ahead. Well, I think I just. Hmm. Part I mean, I can it might. I can kind <laughs> you, of relate. I, I was just gonna say I can kind of relate. You know, it it takes a a special set of people for me to feel. Like, I don't need to sort of change the status quo of what's going on or be influencing it or controlling it in some way. You know, I have to be around some people I'm very, very comfortable with um, in order to. And even even then, you know, I would say to some extent, you know, it's only it's only my own family, I think, more than any anyone where I don't feel like. And this is partially because anytime I'm hanging out with even close friends, I feel like we're doing something. You know, we're, mm. we got to be doing something because we're 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 hanging out together, and we're we should be taking. T you know, I don't for whatever reason. It's only around my own family who I just always lived with and just kind of casually existed alongside of. I mean, even you know when we were living together, me and you. I mean, I would say that probably happened. Where you can just be around somebody without feeling like there's some sort of agenda to the interaction, you know, not like it even consciously making an agenda to the interaction, but like, like what you were saying about how you feel like you need to either be pleasing people or making yourself like the joke of the conversation. I mean, you're trying to change that you're not just comfortable just being there, you know, around other people. Does that make sense? Well... It's not that I'm not comfortable just being around people. I think the thing that I'm uncomfortable with is fitting in perfectly. I mm. feel like part of me feels like I'll never do that because 
I think differently from a lot of people. But part of me also feels that I could do that, but that I would feel fake if I did. And I, I guess it boils down to when I congratulate someone or compliment them or, or interact with them, I instinctively want to be nice to them and, and polite and make them feel good. But I also don't want to, I feel like in a certain way I could do that and my words and actions could be untrue because I'm not telling them what I really think. Or at the very mm. least, I'm I'm manipulating them in a sense because I am trying to change their emotions based on the way that I say something. And so approach an approach that I have started to undertake to some extent is to not completely refrain from using emotion in my interactions, but to... I think part of it is just becoming more expressive with my emotions and mm. being honest with the way I feel about something. But also part of it is 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 exhibiting the emotion that would be appropriate for that circumstance rather than just I don't know. I'm really uh, no, I mean, with this idea I, here. I mean, yeah, it's so there's a couple of things to pull, pull apart there. Like one of the things is the thing you just said about toying with, about displaying the emotion that's appropriate to the situation. I think that most people, and you're right, you do think a little bit differently about these things than a lot of people. I think this is an area where you even might think about things a little bit differently than me. Now, I'm I'm not a socially, you know, I'm not the most socially gifted person out there. But I think most people, when they interact with others, are actually trying to manipulate what's going on with the emotions of the conversation. Um, and it's just kind of taken as like the thing that you do. You know, people are perfectly fine with being manipulative. And part of it is that element of what is the appropriate emotion to convey for an appropriate circumstance. Um, and part of it is getting people to like you. Part of it is um, sort of displaying parts of yourself, sometimes based on what's appropriate and sometimes based on what you want other people to see and hiding other parts of yourself because it's not the appropriate context to display that. It's not necessarily inauthentic. It's more strategic than anything else. You are still the same authentic person. It's well, just that you're not doesn't mean displaying. You're, I, I, I think you're right in the sense that it might not have to do with authenticity at all. I don't think it makes you an authentic person, but I'm not sure it makes you an inauthentic person either. Um, but I think you're right about the, the point about strategy. However, I think the way that I realized I did not like to manipulate other people's feelings in a cert- in a social situation, and of course this is, I'm speaking in, in broad terms, sure. but I realized this because after, I don't know when it was exactly, but I had this sort of epiphany in which I realized I did not like it when other people manipulated my emotions when we mm. were having a discussion or... Or when I was, I think it was when I got to college and started meeting new friends, I realized some people were just trying to fit in. And I was one of Mm -hmm. those people. I was just trying to fit in like everyone else. But I realized that one key factor that could help you distinguish between friends that were going to last and people who were, who were putting up the facade of, of being a potential friend was how sincere they were with you and i think sincere is a better word than authentic Mm. because you cannot you you cannot say something and still be sincere like a lot of people that are sincere hold back from expressing their opinions and their their emotions to people who they're not that comfortable with because they want to have an environment in which they can be sincere Right. Other sincere people might just be overly friendly. Some people are just very, very friendly. And so those are some of the best people in the world. But some of the worst people in the world are also the people who walk into a room and immediately exude charisma and you immediately love them because they are so charismatic and friendly with everybody. Those are the best people in the world. Those are the worst people in the world. It's very hard to tell. Mm-hmm. And I... I mean, yeah, go ahead. I think the reason you might feel so comfortable around your family in a certain sense is because they have they know who you are and they have 
they recognize you for being a sincere human being who is sincere about your relationship with them. And I think in a certain sense, they knew the authentic you as well. They're also comfortable with who I am. That's 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 exactly it. it They know you and they've accepted you. And I think there's that uncertainty as to whether a group of people or another person will accept you. And that's why we tend to, well, maybe not we, maybe I, this is why I tend to feel a bit of anxiety if I'm in, if I'm at a new, in a new environment, if I'm in a group of people who I'm not familiar with. Um, even if I'm, I, I started a new job recently with my coworkers, I tend to be avoidant sometimes. I, I could strike up a conversation, but it's like, well, what's the point? <laughs> it's a very right. kind of cynical cynical perspective but it's because there's the uncertainty that comes with new relationships you don't have the trust you don't have the honesty necessarily you don't have the the knowledge that they will accept you Mm -hmm. is it possible then that your your whole turning kind of being the 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 jokester you know the sort of this having this crackhead energy is a response of trying to almost turn yourself into somebody who isn't worth taking seriously and therefore doesn't need to be accepted. You just accept it as does that, is there any credence to that? You think, is that what you're I think tr- you might be trying right. to do? I think to an extent I might be right. I, I think what it is, it's kind of like beating someone to the, to the punch or whatever. Like I remember uh-huh. there was um in high school, I think I was 13 and I showed up to school And this bigger kid was making fun of my shoes. And he just, he made fun of my shoes and then he spent the whole class making fun of me. And I didn't really respond very much. I just thought about it. I was like, hmm, I wonder if he's right. But I was also thinking, how should I respond? And and I waited until the next day and I came in and he takes one look at me and he points down at my shoes. And I was like, I know my shoes are disgusting. They're awful. And I'm going to get new Uh... ones because I hate these ones so much. Or I didn't even say I'm going to get new ones. I just said, these are awful shoes and I wear them because they're awful. I just like the fact that they're awful shoes. I said something along those lines. Uh And at that point, he just kind of shut up and and left me alone. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Um, And I think that might be the same thing I tend to do when I'm with a group of people that I'm not that comfortable with. I tend to be overly excitable and I tend to, yeah, as you said, put on the facade of being the jokester. Partially because I don't know if I'll be accepted as myself and I don't know what I have to offer. That might be a better way of putting it. I don't know what Mm. I have to offer. And so I know I can offer something through being the comedic edge of the conversation because everyone likes a little humor. And so I'm willing to be – I know that people will will accept that. And so I'm willing to kind of sacrifice my being accepted – well, I'm not sacrificing that. I'm sacrificing my being accepted as my sincere self for the sake of being accepted, which is mm-hmm. quite, that's quite disturbing. Mm-hmm. It's it's like you when you think about these things, you can really un, un, unravel some layers of yourself that you didn't know were there. And yeah, you, you just think and you're like, the ego is such a, such a disturbing, such a marvelous thing that has so many layers. We'll never get to the bottom of it. Oh, yeah. I mean, I I sort of understand what you're... I can sort of empathize with what you're saying um, in as much as I, I think that... I think the area I do this more so, and I'm sure I do it in social cir- circumstances too, is, is in doing what I just did, where I, I will say something and then I will qualify it. Um, it's, it's oftentimes when I present an idea, I will try and throw out lots and lots of qualifiers to make sure that it, it, uh, it, uh, sounds, uh, like it has, it holds water. Um, it, it comes across, I think sometimes, um, sometimes it comes across as if my idea is well thought through. And I think other times it comes across as if I'm not very confident in what it is that I'm saying, because I need to set up all these boundaries around what I'm saying and, and say this is this isn't what I'm saying. Don't don't misunderstand me, because I'm worried that people won't accept what I say, you know, and at, for what it is, or they might have some some opposition to it. And uh, uh, rather than address 
the lack of acceptance rather than address the conflict in that case. I'm more willing to bound my idea up in this nice little box and hand it to them and say, here's this idea. Don't worry about trying to evaluate it. I've already done that for you. You know, it's actually, and, 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 you know, I think it's, it kind of is sort of a, a similar thing when you do it in a social circumstance, but you're actually, you're actually telling the people around you that you don't trust them to, they don't, that you don't trust them to accept you. And therefore you need to make the job easier for them. Yeah. And I've noticed a lot of people do that throughout my life. Oh yeah. I think in almost all new social environments, there will be that person that's kind of carrying the conversation and they're usually like extremely friendly and, and really, really outgoing. And we, we do need those types of people. Otherwise we wouldn't have very many conversations, but there is a sense in which it's hard to articulate this idea, but I think what I'm trying to say is that there's a sense in which manipulation happens in any social interaction perhaps even the very the very decision to interact with another human being is a form of manipulation whether manip whether it means manipulating yourself or manipulating the other person i mean you have to manipulate your your thoughts into words yeah you know you you it's kind of a you're... twist on the idea of manipulation yeah. it's like not but... necessarily a negative word but it's not a positive one either well i mean when you articulate something you are not necessarily relaying all of the information that is in your head. Uh, right. Yet at the same time, when you have a conversation, there is this exchange of information that goes beyond what's in either person's head. It's a very interesting, um, hmm. very interesting thing, right? Because you manipulate your words and you throw them out there. You know, you throw out a part of your idea. And when it, when it comes, you know, when it's sort of, we might describe it as ideas coming out of people's heads, pieces of ideas coming out of people's heads and like hitting each other. And, and sometimes they'll hit and they'll form um, a new idea or they'll, you know, the nugget, the, the nugget that somebody has sent your way, that, that little piece of information or this thought or idea that they have manipulated is useful to you because, and is actually more useful to you than it would be if they had given you their entire thought or idea. They've given you this manipulated piece of it, and that's actually more, much easier to digest than if they had given you everything. Well, you know, That's why when you're, when you're dating somebody for the first time, you don't just tell each other everything about each other and your past relationships and your life and your like, deepest, darkest secrets because you need to be able to digest that stuff in little bite-sized pieces. And then you can start to get to the, the more bigger, full, complex idea. You can't convey that all at once. It's too much for anybody to handle. Yeah, well, okay, here's... So that's a lot to... Yeah, that, I, just, I, just, I put a lot out there. No, 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 that's, that's, <laughs> it's good material. It's just hard to digest quickly. Um, I think what we're arriving at is this sort of weird juxtaposition of ideas. It's in which sincerity requires manipulation in a sense because and and I don't know if we're using the word manipulation correctly but it, it seems to me to be correct because manipulation is to kind of I I picture like playing with play-doh you're kind of like molding mm -hmm. it into what you want it to be and to be sincere with someone you're not going to spill out all your thoughts no one likes the person that just opens their mouth and explains their entire life story to them that is right. just not practical nor is it sincere it's kind of just like your brain is directly connected to your mouth but i think sincerity requires sifting through the rubble that's in your mind because you want to be able to give the other person something worthwhile yeah you and don't want to so just you, give them crap you know you don't want yeah to you have useless. to yeah you have to kind of like weed the garden a bit and figure out what is useful here what is of value that the other person will get out of what I'm giving them? Because you don't want to just be this, this 
unloving person who just gives someone to something that they don't want, that they can't get any use out of. It's, it's, what, what's but arriving yet, in my mind? But yet sometimes we do that. Sometimes we give people information, not for their sake, but for our own sake. You know, whenever every one of us hopefully has an opportunity to at times vent to people about our frustrations and we may filter what we're, what we say in a, in when we vent, but we're not venting. When we vent, we're not throwing out information for other people to process. We're throwing out information to, for validation. We're throwing out information. And in that case, I mean, even for validation, we may be particular about what we throw out, but just, well, just and because that we might convey be... information doesn't mean we're trying to give something to somebody. It may actually be, we're trying to get something. Well, and I think that's another way of sifting through the rubble is to kind of get a, a, third party or or a second person to think about mm. the things that you are thinking about so that you can know the way that they're perceived because your perception of your ideas is one thing but other people's perception is another thing so i think you are right though because there is also a level of manipulation that goes into your venting to another person so that's that's another interesting line of thought one thing i'm thinking of is kind of so bear with me for a moment so sure i've put a decent amount of thought into what true friendship is and i was talking a little bit ago about how it connects to sincerity connects to authenticity i i think i am firmly convinced that if you are in a friendship in which one of you cannot be honest with the other person then there is a problem mm. there's a problem with the friendship and it doesn't mean the friendship needs to be dissolved there are ways to work through the friendship, but friendship requires honesty and the ability to be sincere. And when you are a friend with someone, you want to give the person something that will make your friendship worthwhile. And you should also expect from the other person something for yourself, something that will make the friendship worthwhile. And that might seem selfish, but it's actually not because if you want what, what's best for the other person then expecting them to be a good friend is a is a positive value. If you're mm -hmm. not expecting them to be a good friend, then they live in their own world of self-delusion and are never challenged and really do not learn the proper skills necessary for social interaction. And you're I being think, a bad friend by not expecting them to be a good friend. Exactly. It's very you would think you would instantly think that that's selfish. But I think in a certain sense, it's not selfish. It's mm -hmm. it's actually being a good friend is expecting someone else to be a good friend. So I'm kind of taking that idea and connecting it to this one we're, we're discussing about conversation. Conversation should be mutual. And so in a certain sense, it should be a give and take. You are giving of the ideas that you hold in yourself. It's this opening up of the treasure box to give something of value to the other person. And so of course you're going to manipulate the ideas that you throw out to the other person. Of course you're going to be fake in a sense. Of course you are going to be inauthentic in a sense because the other person does not know every little train of thought that is flowing through your brain. But that is a good thing. Well, not necessarily, but it can be a good thing. It is perhaps a necessary thing to be able to establish a mutual relationship in the conversation. You are giving of yourself something to them that you think is valuable and you are expecting something in return. Otherwise, you should end the conversation. You shouldn't just pretend you're listening and then say, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, you know? <laughs> right. Yeah, it's, it's so fascinating. Yeah. No, I mean... I, I think you put it very well. Um, it is. Yeah. Yeah, I think you put it really well. I'm trying to think how I could build off of it. Um, you could just say, mm-hmm. <laughs> well, that's that's literally what you, you, you said that. And I'm like, no, I can't just say, mm-hmm, okay, mm -hmm, okay. I can't do that. I just I was called you a bad bad friend, but I... Wow. I called you a bad wow. friend, but I did it by, like, building this really, like, formulaic case 
rather than just saying it to your face. But that's because I'm a people pleaser. <laughs> that's like uh, that's like the most passive aggriff- uh, aggressive way to uh, call someone a bad friend, Josh. It's to to tell them they're a bad friend in an intellectual conversation. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah. No, but I, I think it, the, the key idea I'm still stuck with and wrestling with is what exactly manipulation is, I guess. What is its source well, in the brain I, and, and wh- where can it be good? Where can it be bad? I mean, I don't think you need to view manipulation as an exclusively negative thing. I certainly wasn't for any part of this conversation, you know, and maybe, you know, I, I think manipulation for a devious purpose is actually a bad thing. And I think manipulation that is irresponsible and doesn't consider the consequences of what it's doing is a, is fundamentally a bad thing. Okay, so um, I need I, to challenge you on that. So sure. you're saying if it brings about a good result or if the consequences are not so bad, then perhaps it can be a good thing. But the question I have is the consequences for who? And who well, is aware okay. of these consequences? Because okay, so hear me That's, out. So if 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 I do something that brings me happiness or brings mm-hmm. me a source of joy, but manipulate someone else, does that make it ethical? If I if I see okay, this is the probable outcome. If I do this thing at this person's expense, and it's a well, okay. So this kind of comes down to morals because I might hold something in high moral regard and therefore be aiming for that thing and think, okay, this is a necessary manipulation in order to achieve this goal. Okay. What if the other person has a completely different moral framework and does not agree with me, but I'm not telling them because I'm manipulating them? Well, well, okay. So you, you touched on a lot of different things there. Um, Sorry. I'm going to, I'm going to, no, that's okay. That's okay. I'm going to avoid the conversation about different moral frameworks. Because I think the only moral framework we can use to evaluate whether or not manipulation is okay for the individual is the moral framework of the individual, um, and which we could call an absolute moral framework, and that's fine. But for the sake of this conversation, we'll talk about you believe that it's wrong to uh, lie, for example. You might believe that it's wrong to um, you know, tell a falsehood. Um, so, so I would start by saying that there's two, there's two different ways you can manipulate. You could manipulate, manipulation is really just playing with information. Um, You can manipulate by withholding information, or you can manipulate by giving information in such a way that it implies something that is not true, or um, just giving false information, okay? So there's two different, sort of two different sides to manipulation. So we'll just start by kind of throwing that out there. Um, I think that when what what i what i meant by responsible manipulation is is i didn't mean just doing things that to to achieve a positive benefit okay um a, a parent could manipulate their child um by telling them that santa claus is real and he's not going to bring them presents if they don't behave well okay that's a form of manipulation it's it's trying to get the child to behave in a certain way so that santa claus who isn't real will come and bring them presents um, when oftentimes in reality, the parents already bought all the presents and they're just trying to get their kids to behave better. Um, so is that is that a responsible form of manipulation? And that's, and that's the question we'd have to ask. You know, I would say that there are certain... I think that's know, a bit different. A, well, it's, it's, it's still a type of... I guess it's a different type of manipulation. It's just the example that came into my head. It's someone um, that's held to a different standard. Like, for instance, if, if you if your dog is refusing to eat, to eat, then you might want to coax your dog into eating something so that it doesn't starve. Of course, children and dogs are not on the same on the same true. playing field, but there's there's a level of of okay. let's say intelligence or ability to to grasp abstract concepts such as such as good and bad and moral and ethical, those kinds so of you're, things. So you're talking more on, and when you're talking, let's, so let's limit the conversation then to I'm having a conversation with somebody who is my, who, who should be my equal uh, for all things considered. 
Right. That's um, what I I mean, I think but, you're using the extreme situation as your example, which was the parent to the child right. about Santa so, Claus. So let's let's not use that example. Let's instead take this this circumstance. Okay. I have a piece of information that um, would be very, very damaging to you. I'm not telling. I'm. I'm not saying that there is that I have this piece of. I'm just giving an example. Okay. Say I had a piece of information that could absolutely wreck. Um, could, would absolutely devastate you. Um, now I. I don't know what kind of piece of information I would have that I would think, man, Josh couldn't handle this. Um, I I'm need getting a little be, nervous here. <laughs> I need to be really, really careful about how I convey this information to him in such a way that I'm going to do the most good while doing the least damage. Um, and I think at the end of the day, that's what I mean when I say responsible manipulation. You know, um, if, you're, if your best buddy, um, if your best buddy's girlfriend or wife has been cheating on him and you happen to know this, how do you convey that to him in, a, in the most helpful way possible um, and, and while, while attempting, you know, you know there, at the end of the day, you can only do so much. Now, again, this is an extreme example. Why am I using the extreme example? Because there's a little bit more obviousness to the fact that, okay, yeah, there's a, a better way and a worse way to tell somebody this. And this is a pretty, like, this is going to be a hard piece of information to handle. On the other hand, sometimes it, in some, and there's some pieces, there's some things like that where, again, I don't even know if we're talking about manipulation anymore if I'm just going off on a rabbit trail. There's some pieces of information like that where anybody who hears it is going to have a hard time hearing. There's other pieces of information where, you know, okay, so say for example, you have a, um, you have um, a, a family member who's, actually, who's just a little bit more sensitive than everybody else, okay? Their feelings are more easily hurt. Um, by things that, you know, um, you know, I could, I could make fun of you all day, Josh, and I, you might, you might not like some of the things I said, you might even be hurt a little bit, but you're going to recover. Our friendship is going to recover from that. Um, you're not going to leave at the end of the day angry, or if you were to, if, if you were to be angry with me, you would tell me, I'm sure there's people who just wouldn't respond that way. And, and in that case, if you have constructive criticism for somebody, you have to be more manipulative in how you convey that. Um, I've I've spoke for a while here. I'm I'm not sure if if what I'm saying is making sense relative to our our conversation. No, it definitely is. Okay. Um, what do you, I what think, do you think about some of the stuff I've said? Well, you're kind of right in kind of laying out different kinds of manipulation, which you previously did. So there's like withholding information, or giving information, or twisting information in a certain sense. Um, or deciding just how to how to deliver the news. Um, I think at the end of the day, it comes down to duty in a sense. Is this your responsibility to deal with? So in a, a situation that you find really awkward, like if you found out someone's cheating on someone else and it's really not any of your business, then perhaps saying nothing is the best response. And if it's if it's a close friend of yours, maybe you tactfully find a way to address the situation with him. And of course you're going to want to be you're going to want to formulate the best way to deliver the information to him because you don't want you don't want a tornado to to emerge and destroy everything around you um mm-hmm. and around him um but yeah there is this sense in which you need to you need to think what is the truth and is the truth being reached in this in this situation so for instance if there is a family member that you have who frequently just spouts, uh, I don't want to say spouts nonsense. <laughs> uh, if, if you have a family member who just speaks their mind a bit too much, let's say, or, <laughs> or, or walks over other people's like a treadmill, tre- has a treadmill personality and mm-hmm. no one really stands up to them, then perhaps for the truth of the situation to be reached, you need to tell them, do you realize the way you are impacting other people and treating them like they are lower than you? Perhaps that conversation is necessary, but perhaps if there's a different uh, 
like situation in which you have let's say just a a like your your brother is a goofball who acts up at at every social event you have and everyone calls him out on it and he knows and he just still acts like a goofball maybe there's a certain point in which saying something to him is not going to be worth anything like giving wisdom to a fool and he'll just play around in the mud with it you know so yeah, yeah it's where is the truth and well and, and how the- do we ob- obtain the truth for all parties involved in this situation right i mean and then there's the subconscious element of it which is like it has a lot more to do with just the general social interactions you know am i conveying authentic emotion around other people how necessary is it that i convey my authentic emotions right now would anybody else benefit from me conveying my authentic emotions i mean i will confess sometimes when i'm around extended family and i don't mean this I, i it's 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 not all the time but but there are times when I'm around extended family, and and it, a lot of it has to do with my age, where I simply don't feel like conversing with people. I don't feel like inter- doing a with. I I don't feel like having a lot of interactions, and part of that's because I personally um, get more out of being in a small intimate group. Where I can have a feel like I can have a real conversation with people, rather than being around a lot of people. Um, would it do me good to mope in the corner, um, or even to articulate that wow, I really hate being around all these people to everybody? Right. Or would it be better for me to just try and do my best to put on a, a bit of a facade, and that's what it is. Let's call it what it is, and try and try and interact for a little bit. And then maybe just take a break. You know, do, do, there's a balance to it, right? Well, you know, I'm not... Yeah, it's, it's what's, what's your hierarchy of value in this situation. And if you determine getting getting along with your relatives to be a higher value than being able to be your most authentic self, then yeah, maybe put on a bit of a facade because it's a higher value to you that you get along with your relatives. Um, I I don't know if there's an easy answer to that situation though because if you're frequently in these awkward situations with distant relatives then perhaps you need to just tell them honestly i i'm not in the mood to socialize right now or something like that and and withdraw from that situation because it goes back to the idea of the give and take of a conversation if you're not actually interested in having a conversation with someone then they're probably not getting much out of it. And it's kind of selfish for you to, Mm -hmm. not you, but it's kind of selfish to to engage in a conversation you deem meaningless or not worthwhile simply simply for the sake of maintaining external harmony. Well, but then, then there's one more piece to this which we haven't considered yet, and that is the fact that sometimes when it comes to a situation where you're not inclined to do a certain thing, so again, going to the situation with the relatives, and I don't want it to seem like I just hate hanging around with my extended family. I love hanging out with my extended <laughs> family. I have to like extra clarify that because this is going on record. But um, yeah, your external like, family is like listening to this. They're like, "What?" I know, I know. <laughs> or your extended no, family. but like, but but like, it's it's a it's a matter of um, there there are two responses. If you have a high if it's a high enough value to you that you get along and harmonize with your family you don't you will either you either fake it till you make it or the or you or if if you don't fake it you will chain you will actually become the person who is able to do the thing that you initially did not want to do in other words you can you can you can be intentional if you are and this is I, I think this is the key is if you are in a social situation where you feel like it, you are initially inauthentic if it's really a high enough value to you to act in a way that doesn't necessarily feel authentic eventually that will become it, it sort of almost takes on an authenticity right because you have you 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 have a you you do value what you're doing, even though it's not what you feel like doing. You're not defined by your feelings. You, there's a value to what you're doing, and 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 you know if um if I 
don't feel like um being a if I don't feel like um being a good friend to somebody at a particular time. Um maybe it's because I'm I'm feeling lazy, you know. Okay. Well, would it be inauthentic for me to go and and actually be a friend to them? It's like, no. It wouldn't be because I would be stepping outside of my feelings and saying, "Hold on a second. I need to be a good friend. This is what I should do." And this is a higher value to me than satisfying my need to just do things because I feel like I, I want to do them. I'm going to do this because I should do it. And um, in doing it, then it becomes an authentic action. Because authenticity isn't necessarily tied up in your feelings, um, I guess would be my point there. Right. And there is a certain sense in which the sincerity, the authenticity, the resolution to do something or say something beco becomes important if you're if it's aligning with your values um for for instance my dad worked for i want to say like 15 years in this in this warehouse where he was in charge of like stock rooms and stuff like that and his job was pretty grueling he worked a lot of hours didn't really make as much money as he wanted to but his he made money for the family and was able to provide for countless years for my entire family and because of that he found he went to work every day and enjoyed doing it and had a positive spirit about him i know because he he always just exuded this this positive positive charisma this mm. optimism and he I don't think it's because he particularly enjoyed the work he was doing or the environment there. Um, I think it was more because he desired, above all, to place family first and was willing to make the sacrifice. The only danger in doing something like that, well, not the only danger, I'm sure, but a danger in doing that, in, in kind of sacrificing what you want in the present for some sort of future reward is that you can become bitter if you mm. are constantly just sucking it up and putting on the fake face for your family or friends right. and 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 not being sincere with them it could lead to you being bitter because you are either mad at yourself for not being able to be sincere with them or you're mad at them because you feel like they're creating an environment in which you do not feel accepted or not just bitter but you might start to lose touch with your values you might not you might start to not real not know who your true friends are if you're being inauthentic around all of your the people that you consider friends have you taken a step back and asked the question are these my true friends if i cannot be sincere with them are these family members and, and, truly people that I desire a relationship with, or am I just pacifying them because they're family? And again, I would I would go back to what is your higher value? You know, if your if your value here is to get people to like you, then um then that's then yeah, that's that's not gonna get you very far. And and honestly, when we talk about manipulation, when we talk about inauthenticity, I think that's probably one of the first things we mean is a lot of times people are just manipulative and they're not authentic because they are people pleasers and they just want people to like them. Um and, and that's why they're changing what they're doing. They're not changing what they're doing to accomplish some some strategic um, sort of value goal. I mean, they are, but the value is a dumb value. It's a value of getting people to like them, um, which I mean, usually comes from a place of either being incredibly self-centered or not having enough, uh, attention. You don't actually have enough people who actually do like you and accept you, um, for who you are. Um, and, and I mean, when you, when that is the value you're manipulating towards, um, you know, it's of course you're going to become bitter because um, sometimes you know the facade is going to fall, um, and of course then you could still become bitter when when working for a good purpose too. That's not to say that, but I think 
when, when you talk about friendship, I think if you are being a good friend with, with the, the real intent of, uh, when you're, when you're interacting with people with the real intent of their well being, um, and, and the well being of the relationship and of the friendship, not forsaking all else, not forsaking your own desires or interest, but maybe sort of putting them aside temporarily and, and occasionally you know, just judging what is appropriate to take hold of. You know, I'm going to set aside this desire I have right now, um, but not set aside this need I have. You know, I might, I might desire to be left alone, but I don't need to be left alone. I can tolerate this. So I'm going to tolerate this for the well-being of the relationship and for the well-being of others. Um, that sort of thing. Yeah, there is there is a sense in which that's true. And I think the I think if it weren't true then the people that we revered most would not be those who kind of sacrificed everything they had for the good of of humans or the good of the group. I mean, Tale of Two Cities, great example. Um, I forget the names of the guys, but there's this one guy who's in a French prison unjustly, and there's this other guy who, who's who's basically a lookalike, and he sneaks in and trades places with the guy, knowing he'll be sentenced to the guillotine. Um, but he does it simply because he sees in the other man something, something deeply human, I guess. Something worth hmm. saving. I, I haven't read that story in a long time. I'll have to go back and read yeah. it again. It's a really kind of tragically hopeful ending. <laughs> mm -hmm. Because the, the character with the best transformative arc dies, but he dies doing the best thing he did in his life. Yeah, it was, it's a good book. Hmm. It's a good story. Interesting. So, any any final thoughts before we wrap this up? No, I was just thinking myself that it's a, it's a good good spot to wrap it up here. So, uh Yeah, I guess we'll call it the call at the end of the podcast. It's a good conversation. Yeah, well, it was, it was, a, it was good to have this conversation. Good to yeah. be able to talk with you. You've been listening to another Philosophical Tuesday, a production of the Intellectual Stooges. Thank you for listening. And we hope you'll join us again next Tuesday for another episode. 